It's always a tough, uh, tough follow for the sermon after that. But um, so uh, when, many years ago, um, there were a trilogy of movies that came out called uh, Lord of the Rings. Many of you have heard of them. Um, they were a little bit indie, but some people watched them. Um, so I knew nothing about Lord of the Rings other than that I've seen the BBC Hobbit cartoon. Um, and I was like, all right, I think I get this. My wife was very excited. She knew everything. She told me nothing. So I went to see this movie in the theaters and it's getting close to three hours in and I'm thinking, how long is this movie? <laughs> and when are they gonna wrap things up? There are a lot of loose ends here. How is this movie gonna end? And then Frodo, who's one of the characters, is going up a hill, it's over. And I'm like, what kind of German storytelling is this? <laughs> like, it's the most nihilistic ending ever. It was just boom. And I figured out um, that, um, you know, there's more, there's more. <laughs> um, and and it, I struggled with it. I struggled with it because, part of, partially because uh, I'm an American and we like happy endings. We like things tightly wrapped up. We are incurably optimistic. Even when everything seems to be going wrong, we're like, ah, oh, it's gonna work out. It'll all work out. <laughs> um, and we like our stories to be told that way. And the way that we like our stories to be told, the way that we're told stories, the way that we engage story, shapes our character, shapes who we are in this world and what we see as good and bad and valuable and not valuable. Um, and Palm Sunday is not a very American story. It is not. Obviously, it's Jewish, so, and in Israel. So, um, but it's not a very American story. If you can set the scene of Palm Sunday, right? There's a lot going on. Jesus has been spending three years wandering around Jerusalem. Everyone's been waiting. When's he going to go to Jerusalem? When's he going to go to Jerusalem? He's not going to Jerusalem. He went towards it. He walked away from it. And he's doing all these miracles. He's healing people. He's speaking deep truths. He is casting out demons. He's controlling nature. He's doing all of this stuff. He's fulfilling Old Testament messianic prophecy after prophecy. He is giving a new law. There's all kinds of stuff going on here. A lot of people are like, I think that might be the Messiah. A lot of people thought that. The disciples thought that. In fact, they had a whole argument with each other about who gets what rank in the kingdom to come. And the reason they did, and the reason the crowd is so excited about him, is because their image, their story of this Messiah is one who will overthrow Rome and set up the kingdom of God through the people of Israel. That's the expectation. That has been the expectation. That's been the hope. You can imagine if you were in the position they were in and you had all these prophecies and you saw someone starting to fulfill them and seems to be claiming it, you would have an expectation for him and a hope. And one of the biggest hopes you would have is the physical release from the oppressive rulers that are, that are hanging over your head, right? That's expectation. That's the American story. 
That's what he should do. And so when he comes into Israel and the crowds are, Hosanna, Hosanna, and they're throwing down and welcoming the king, and they expect him to go to the temple and to set it up. It's time. It's happening. At the same time, Jesus is having a very different experience here. He is coming in. He is coming in not to become king, but as king, right? Riding on the donkey, he is king. He is heading to the temple, not to do what they think he's going to do. He's going to turn over all the tables, right? He's going to chase people out. He's going to clean house. Um, And on that path, the statement comes from him, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How long will you kill my my prophets? How I have longed to gather you up as chicks, as a mother hen gathers chicks. There's a true mourning. We have a mourning king coming in to his kingdom. We see it in the prayer where he sweats blood, where he says, Lord, have this cup pass from me. We see it in this prayer. We have a true mourning king, but none of the people see it. His disciples don't see it. His family doesn't see it. No one sees it. They all have their story that they need to be told. And it is not the story. Right? And we came in like that. We come in, Hosanna, Hosanna, welcome to the king. And then we flip. We flip the story. And there's a different story being told here. And it's really important that we pause and we stop right here and we don't jump from Palm Sunday celebration to Easter. At the heart of Christianity is this. This story where he's had this wonderful meal with the disciples, where he has revealed many deep truths. This wine in his blood is his blood. This bread is his body. He has washed their feet. He has shown a different kind of king, right? Different, different narrative. They must have been feeling great. All these things are happening. And then there's Judas, one of his, that has been with him for three years, betraying him with a kiss. Very different story. In this story, Jesus is the one who will be betrayed, abandoned, tortured, mocked, crucified, and mocked some more. That's different. And it makes me think of, as a chaplain, I used to work um, in the hospitals and the hospice. Um, and um, we'd have, so I would get people who had been through the cancer fight. And there's no more fight left to have. And they have decided they would rather have a few months of quality time than six months of pain. Right, this, this fight has ended. And a lot of times they come to this conclusion long before their family is at that conclusion. So they decide, I can't do this anymore. The doctors have said, there's really, I mean, we're just, there's nothing we can do. And the family would say, well, you've got to fight. You've got to fight. You've got to do it. But the fight's over. It's done. It's now about being with the ones you love and making that time count. It's two very different stories. And one of the most important things is that those stories come together. Right? That's, that's kind of the work I, I did. 
is let's get your family on the same page as you. Right? And so Jesus is not going to fight. Not the fight that I think he's going to fight. His fight is about love. His fight is about going to this cross. His fight is against all the powers of the devil and all the evils that sin can devise. Think about the cross. What is the cross? It's sick. Literally, there are people who probably sat in a room together and were like, how do we get these people to behave? Well, torture is always good. Um, How about we crucify people and we line them up on roads so that people can see what happens when you come against Rome? Right? It's a projection of power. It's, it's wicked. It's the, the things that people can come up with. Um, and that very thing, that very wicked thing, the things of betrayal, the things of abandonment, the very wicked things, the things of stories we thought we were on that have been broken. These very wicked things of sin, death, and the devil, all working together. And Christ takes all of that. I mean, look, we got that thing right there. That's a torture device. That is a torture device. And he takes all of it and turns it. He turns it to the very way that he will redeem the world. Right? This is a new story. He takes all of it, whatever it is, whatever story you thought your life was, whatever betrayals you have had, whatever tortures, whatever evils have come in this world, right? The reason we, we reenact this story, right? So we understand. You can't jump from Palm Sunday to Easter when you are in a world where people have cancer. You can't jump from Palm Sunday to Easter when you're in a world where there is war, where there's betrayal, where there's people who abandon each other in marriage, you can't jump to Easter. The cross has something to say. And the cross says, I will redeem it all. And we know it's true because of Easter. But the cross must speak first. And so this week, I invite you to to step before the cross with all of your sins, with all of your losses, with all of your sicknesses, with all the things that that cross can represent. And hold it up before him and look at his wounds and spend some time on Monday, Thursday, entering the Last Supper, washing each other's feet, getting that miracle revealed to you of body and blood, right? Some time on Good Friday to stand before the cross with our sins on Holy Saturday to feel the weight of loss. The disciples, the people who love Jesus, they were traumatized. Can you imagine? They, that event would have been so traumatic for them that it probably affected their health. It probably affected their bodies. It got in their bones. It definitely got in their imaginations. Spend a little time in the traumas of this world and in our lives. And then when we get to Easter, it'll mean that much more to us when his promise to conquer death, sin, and the devil, and to give us all the new things, that sequel, part two, and then his coming again, part three, right? So right now we stand at the cross, but we stand with hope. 
And we know that God will make all things new. Amen? Amen. Amen.